Can you tell I'm a little chilly? <laughs> I meant to say something about my red, white, and blue hoodie today for Veterans Day. This is my high school. He's drawing Mustangs. Raw. Put my sucker down. And let's go to chapter four of our book. What's the name of it? Wakes and High Stakes. You saw the title, but see, I haven't done it yet. So at this momento in time. Okay, chapter four. My fingers dot. Should have done this first. I'm sorry. No, I don't even have any. Is that the thing to clean them off with? But I do like this. Sorry. <sighs> Breath melted off. Okay, sorry about that. Put myself in the eye. My fingers dial the number before my brain has time to realize what's happening. Eric, you better get to the marina. His first question is to confirm that I'm all right, which is adorable and deserves acknowledgement, but my gratitude will have to wait. Instead, I quickly fill him in on the events aboard the Jewel of the Harbor. And sorry to have to say this, but those events include a body dangling from a rope secured to the railing of the top deck. Remember, yesterday we were like, what? Or I was with the rope. My father, Jimmy, my father, Jimmy, and Arnie have secured a perimeter on both the middle and top decks. While the captain steers the boat back toward its mooring, the guests dash about, frantically gazing at everyone with heightened suspicion. I kick my extrasensory perceptions into overdrive and hunt for clues. Letitia Whitecloud is nowhere to be found. At this point, I'm not sure if that makes her guilty or innocent, but it's worth noting. Roman Barnes has bellied up to the bar, and in the short time since the scream alerted us all to the unfortunate incident, he's thrown back at least two whiskeys and tossed a crumpled cigarette pack on the deck. For some inexplicable reason, the band is still playing <laughs> a jazzy Charleston, and for a moment I feel as though I'm aboard the Titanic, and we're all supposed to to pretend all, that everything's all right as we slowly drown. Slipping down the ladder I discovered earlier, I'm surprised to find the private poker game still in session. However, this time when I pass through the room, one of the players looks up. What's all the commotion up top? I can't say for certain it's murder, but the silly Barnes is dead. That's the husband, right? Murmurs circle, who was about to get it before when she interrupted. Murmurs circle around the poker table and a small nervous man suggests they call it a night. The dealer stops shuffling and waits for consensus. The man who posed the original question about the commotion seems to hold sway over the rest of the players. Not on your life, Dickens. It's not our fault if you don't know when to quit. We finish this hand and then you pay up. My clear sentience picks up on a visceral wave of fear from the man called Dickens. <laughs> I can safely assume he's unable to cover his bet. Not my concern. Sneaking down the back stairs, I check the suites below deck all empty this time. As I pass through a stretch of the passageway with no hatches, I get a strange tingling on my ring finger. I look down and simply see polished wood paneling, but I have more than the average passenger's experience with secret doorways. 
and something about the tingling in the image stirs my curiosity. I run my hand over the paneling near the top of the wall and feel an indentation hidden in the shadow. Hesitantly slipping my finger in, I press. A section of the paneling pops open, and I'm not entirely surprised to be gazing into the somewhat shocked face of Letitia Whitecloud. Pushing the door fully open, I smile. Miss Whitecloud, I'm sure you'll want to come above deck to speak to the sheriff about the murder that so recently occurred on your gambling boat. <clears throat> Without waiting for a reply, I turn and rush down the passageway before she can pull out the gun she most certainly has in her pearl evening bag. Racing up the stairs near the bow, I come face to face with Iris and her husband. She's shaking her head in violent, violent disagreement. He's mumbling in a very menacing tone. They both fall absolutely still and silent when they see me. Maybe she needs some kind of bailout from this threatening exchange. I'm nothing if not helpful and curious, but mostly helpful. I'm sorry, aren't, aren't you Iris? Roman was looking for you. He's at the bar on the main deck. He seems very upset. After dispensing the lie, I sink into my psychic gifts. Iris seems to seal herself off in a prison of ice while her husband's anger instantly shifts to protectiveness. He grips her firmly by the arm and tugs her back up the stairway. Come along, Iris. Let's go deal with your insufferable baby brother. Cheesy, crazy. Not all families are created equal, that's for sure. I hurry up the steps after them, but my stomach swirls with a flash of nausea as the boat slows and spins awkwardly in the water. We must be nearing the docks in the marina, and I definitely want to get my hands on Eric before anyone else does. Racing to the port side as we slowly motor toward the dock, I search the shore and find the sheriff and four of his deputies waiting on the gangplank. As soon as the boat comes in range, two dock workers, probably conscripted by Eric, tie off the boat. Two deputies man the gangplank ensuring that no one exits without an interview while Eric, flanked by Deputy Paulson and Furious Monkeys, Deputy Bard, boards the ship with the confidence and bluster of an old-fashioned pirate raid. While I make a beeline for Eric, he nods in my direction and sends Paulson toward the body. By the time I reach the sheriff, Deputy Bard has commandeered the microphone and is directing the passengers to form a queue on the main deck. The rest of her speech is lost as I let Eric slip a protective arm around my waist. How do you get yourself into these things, Moon? Let me remind you, I'm a guest, Sheriff Harper, not a suspect. He shakes his head. No, you're not a suspect this time, but that doesn't mean you're not under suspicion. Before you walks too far down that road, Sheriff, I thought you might like to know that the victim argued with several people over the course of the evening, and nearly all the female attendees are wearing gloves. Oh, also, it might interest you... <clears throat> That Letitia White Cloud, Jimmy, and Arnie are running this operation. Eric raises his eyebrows and nods thoughtfully. I was made aware of her involvement by the tribal council. I'm sure there was some bribery and possibly even some blackmail involved, but I'm curious to know your source. I opened my mouth to answer. Welcome aboard, Sheriff Harper. Let Letitia Whitecloud know if there's anything the boys can do for you. Eric takes in the vision and white that is Letitia Whitecloud and tilts his head my way. Smiling, I whisper, asked and answered, Your Honor. He slips past me to continue his investigation and I suddenly feel the burning need to find the demure Violet Barnes. My search below deck was fairly thorough, but I have yet to make it topside. 
I casually wandered toward the staircase at the bow of the vessel and climbed to the uppermost deck. There, leaning over the railing, weeping and tossing bits of torn paper into the lake, is Violet. Approaching slowly, I offer my condolences. Excuse me, it's Violet, isn't it? I'm so sorry about the second tragedy. She turns, and the harbor lights reveal streaked mascara and swollen eyes. I actually loved my mother, you know. Iris doesn't speak for all of us. Vasily made my mom happy. I close the distance and gently pat her shoulder. I'm glad to know your mother was happy at the end. So many of us never have that chance. I knew something terrible was going to happen after that huge fight at the estate. I don't understand why she left everything to Basili in the will. She could have tossed a few thousand dollars to Iris and Roman. That's all they cared about, money. When they found out she left everything to him, they lost it, you know. I'm pretty sure I've cracked the case regarding what call Eric was on earlier and why he was so unsurprised to hear about the tragedy during tonight's memorial service. What about you? Didn't you want anything of your mother's? She sniffles loudly. Maybe a few knickknacks, just memories. Vasily said he would see that we were all taken care of. I don't know what the big deal was. You said you were worried something like this would happen. Did someone threaten violence uh, this afternoon? Fortunately, the bereaved younger sister is too emotional to be suspicious. Not, not exactly. Roman said he'd find a way to invalidate the will, and Iris said she'd never let Vasily walk away with everything, but no one threatened to kill him. At the mention of Vasily's murder, my mood ring turns icy, and I glance down to see an encore presentation of the rope. Violet, was it you that screamed before I mean? Her innocence vanishes in a heartbeat, and the bitter stain that taints her sister's beauty bubbles to the surface. Who did you say you were? I'm Mitzi. My grandmother was a close friend to your mother. She steps away, and her sorrow turns to distrust. My mother didn't have any friends, especially not ones her own age. Violet turns to leave, but trips on her own shoe. I instinctively reach out to steady her. Are you okay? Something wrong with your shoe? She yanks her arm from my grasp, adjusts her boa with a gloved hand, and marches toward the stairs with an uneven gait. There's no point hurrying after her. I've gotten all the information I can from Violet Barnes. Heading down a deck toward the gangplank plank to check in with Eric, I notice the crowd is wadding up around the exit like a herd of sheep at the gate, but these sheep are getting restless and angry. I force my way through the crowd with some nonsense comments about having important information for the sheriff, but when I arrive and see the two deputies barely keeping the agitated guest on board, I hastily make a new plan. Hey, deputy! The thick neck one with black hair looks que looks up questioningly. I nod. Yeah, you'll do. Did you get a copy of the guest list? His eyes register more anxiety than his powerful stance would indicate as he shakes his head. I turn and address the crowd in my last call voice. Has anyone seen the young kid who checked you in and announced your name when you boarded? Most shake their head, but lucky for me, the kid I'm talking about is hidden amongst the crowd and pushes his way forward. Do you mean me? Depends. You got the guest list? He waves his clipboard and nods. Make way, folks. Make way. Once he gets us that guest list, we'll have you out of here in 15 minutes. The crowd parts like the Red Sea in a school High school-aged boy in an ill-fitting gangster suit rushes forward. 
he hands me the clipboard. Uh, so I'm not on that list, but I got to get home. My mom has to work the graveyard shift at the cannery, and I got to babysit my little sister. Come with me and keep your mouth shut. The scrawny teenager falls in line behind me. I approach the two deputies. Deputy, is your name Tag say Johnson? Any relation to Odell? He shakes his head. No relation. I get that a lot, though. Myrtle's Diner's pretty popular, and folks say I kind of look like him. He absolutely looks nothing like Odell Johnson, my grandmother's first husband and my surrogate grandfather, but like Grams always says, more flies with honey. Sure, I, I can see that. I tell you what, I've got something here that's going to make your job real easy, and I only need a tiny favor in exchange. He looks at the angry mob behind me, leans forward and whispers, you're the one dating the sheriff, right? I grin, correct. Whatever you say goes. I gotta say, I'm liking this Deputy Johnson more and more by the minute. Here's a clipboard with the entire guest list. This wonderful young man made a check mark by each name as they boarded the vessel. Now he's got to go immediately. That's the favor. And all you have to do is read off these names and make a little X when they leave. I'll ask them if they have any helpful information or saw anything suspicious. If we work on this together, we should have them out of here in no time. The fact is, everyone was up on the main deck waiting for the door prize to be awarded. Do we have a deal? He takes the clipboard, pulls a pen from his pocket and says, let's do this. The young man, whose name I'm sorry to say I didn't ask, runs down the gangplank and and sprints toward the bus stop. Boy, do I remember those days. The deputy begins calling the roll, and I casually question the guests as they pass by. As predicted, everyone was on the main deck, hoping that his or her name would be called for. Called for the door prize. As we wait for a particularly ancient couple to hobble down, hobble down the gangplank with a walker and a four-footed cane, Deputy Johnson asked, what was the door price? $300 in chips to be used aboard the Jewel of the Harbor. He scoffs, what a racket. I tilt my head in agreement. You're not wrong. The elderly pair... Irma and Willard finally reach us. I don't need to ask if they saw anything. Because I don't think either of them has seen anything or heard anything in a decade. <laughs> That's mean. The deputy and I exchange knowing glances and his partner gestures for the couple to disembark. Did they say if there was going to be cake? Irma shouts to her husband as they toddle down the gangway. He hollers back. I'm sure there'll be another wake, Irma. Somebody said something about another dead guy. <laughs> oh, I love it. Deputy Johnson plows through the remainder of the guest list. By the time we reach the inner circle of family, Violet has taken off her shoes and refuses to make eye contact with me. Not to be rude, but she looks positively horrible. Her skin is a greenish hue, indicating perhaps late onset seasickness. A combination of smeared mascara and eyeliner makes dark circles under her eyes, and her finger waves have waved bye bye. <laughs> Just the family left, right? Deputy Johnson asked, right? And the crew, that's Violet there, the middle child. I don't see Roman, but I assume he's still at the bar, and behind Violet is the oldest sister, Iris Barnes Becker, and her husband, whose first name I don't actually know. Deputy Johnson runs his pen across the page, says, here is Tom. You better take statements from the family. I don't think they were waiting to find out who won the door prize, and According to some insider information, they pretty much all have motives. 
Thank you, Miss Moon. We'll take it from here. I sure do appreciate you calming the angry masses. He smiles and nods gratefully. I guess it's true what they say about you. Pasting on a fake smile, I hope that what they say about me is that I'm wonder I'm a wonderfully kind person and I'm crossing my fingers that no one is saying anything to this deputy about my psychic powers or suspicion thereof. I hope it's all good. The strangled chuckle escapes pretty much. No one really listens to Paulson. This information produces a genuine belly laugh, which I immediately attempt to hide because it seems kind of rude to laugh. At a memorial service turned murder scene. Pleasure working with you, Deputy Johnson. Good luck with the statements. He tips his chin and I hurry up the gangplank to find Eric. As I approach the back of the boat, raised voices echo off the water. I'm not the least bit interested in what kind of immunity you think you have, White Cloud. The murder was committed on your vessel, and we're impounding it until the crime is solved. If you have any helpful information you'd like to share to speed things along, Johnson and Gilbert will be happy to take your statements when you leave the boat. Letitia steps closer to Eric and lowers her voice to almost a whisper. Letitia White Cloud doesn't forget, Sheriff. She turns and shoves past me. I teeter over the railing, but I'm in no real danger. Jimmy and Arnie follow close behind, but surprisingly have the courtesy to turn sideways as they pass me rather than dogpile on their boss's rudeness. Last in line is my father. The strain on his face would be evident even to a daughter without special gifts. But I sense the fear and anxiety underneath his exhaustion. We should probably get out of here, Dad. He leans he leans toward me and whispers, Are you sure you're done snooping? Rude. <laughs> but his comment does get me thinking, actually... Can you distract Eric for a few minutes? There's something I need to grab on the upper deck. He exhales and his shoulders slump. I wasn't serious. Don't ask the question if you don't want to know the answer. I spin around on my ruby slippers and hoof it up to the top deck. Kneeling nearer, I found Violet weeping earlier. I collect all the torn pieces of paper that didn't make it into the Great Lake. Then I circle around to the stern and take a careful panoramic mental picture for later enhanced psychic replay. The railing, the deck, the rope, all the tools involved in ending Vasily's life. And that is all of chapter four. And we'll stop there. Wow, wow, wow. One thing after another. Gotta keep the books coming in the series, right? Something like 20, 22, 23 books in the series. Wow, wow, wow. But we're on book eight. Love ya. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Keep Kim in your prayers, too. I thought about that. You know, my daughter Kim that had the lung transplant. Keep her in your prayers that her body does not reject that lung. I haven't heard anything bad. I just want to keep her prayed up and uh, talk some else. Oh, there's so many. We'll check Denny's list. Jaxie. Jaxie and her family. Creations by Jax. J-A-X. Seems like I'm somebody else. Anyway. Love y'all. Be sweet. And me and my guts.
Thank you. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Bye.